The Truth About Goblins Chapter 37 With a full night's worth of sleep at last, Safira felt up to another full day of business. She had finally managed to bully Timothy into letting her run the shop on her own for a while, which meant that he would be getting some much-needed sleep as well. The thought was comforting. Of course, she still hadn't recovered from the last few days. The mines, the cabin, the strange magician. The last instance worried her more than the rest. Every time someone came through the door, she would look up from her work, afraid to set eyes on that same hooded figure. She didn't mention any of it to Timothy, though she felt that he knew, in some way or another, that she was troubled. Unfortunately, she couldn't push her emotions aside so easily, not like Kit and Annie. Stocking the shelves behind her with full boxes of tea leaves, her mind wandered back to her friends. Despite the terrors she had experienced with them, there was still a part of her that wished they would come back through the door, bringing that high-strung, hyper-energy along with them. But as the night passed into rush hour, and rush hour passed into the lazy hours of the early morning, neither Kit nor Annie showed up at the shop. Safira, even as she worked, waited for something to interrupt the rhythmic calm. It was with no small amount of disappointment that she locked the door for the night and proceeded to close up shop. She wondered what Kit and Annie were doing at that moment, what crazy adventures they were having. Weary from being on her feet all day, she dragged herself up the stairs, trying to push aside her lingering anxiety. Strange as it was, she was afraid to enter the apartment. There was a voice in her head that told her it was dangerous, even though she knew the magician wouldn't be coming back. How did he know so much about me? She shook her head, blotting out the thought. There was no sense in worrying about it now. Reaching the top of the staircase, she stopped. Music from the apartment. Careful not to interrupt, she pushed the door open and slipped inside. It was coming from the piano normally buried amongst books and discarded sheets of paper in the far corner. Timothy had risen from his deep sleep and was treating himself to a bit of song. Safira had never heard him play, at least not like this. He had played simple melodies in the past, when the evenings seemed long and the hours begged to be played away but she could not recall ever hearing music so intricate and sorrowful. She took a step closer, watching his fingers dance across the piano. It was almost as if some of the keys were moving on their own. She couldn't look away. At first, he hit the keys decisively. The rhythm was concrete, the pace definite. But as the song continued, the notes fell into one another, lazily overlapping as if the music itself was hesitant to move forward, as if it wished that it could somehow move against the flow of time and remain still. It gradually grew quieter, and Safira thought it would fade out completely. But with a surge of renewed energy, he brought his hands down and summoned an overwhelming melody that filled the room. Again he pounded the keys, bearing down on the piano with a frightening passion. Anger. Rage. But just as the notes hit a climax, the resolve of his music faded into a sort of quiet despair. Repeating, always repeating. An echo without end. And throughout the constant sway of the sound, there was a trace of some nameless desire. It was quiet, but the uplifting note seemed to push and pull the song, slowly changing its very essence. But it was fleeting, feeble, weak. A moment later, the music fell back into sorrow. 
There was no single word for it. Regret, remorse, a certain kind of grief, but also bitterness. It was almost difficult to listen to. But even as Safira became aware of this feeling, it dissipated back into regret. And then the music began to fade, leaving nothing in its wake but emptiness. Silence. Finished with the piano, Timothy pulled his hands away, letting them fall to his sides. He seemed exhausted with the effort, as if the song itself had somehow drained him. There he remained. Motionless. That was beautiful, she whispered. He jumped to his feet, knocking the piano bench to the ground. Safira, I didn't know you would be... I didn't think you were... He sighed and looked down at the mess. Goodness, sorry about that. He proceeded to pick up the bench and scattered papers. Don't be sorry she said, stooping down to help. I don't think I've ever heard you play like that. She caught his gaze and smiled. You're very talented. I, uh... He blushed and looked away. Thank you. I've had a lot of practice. You should play more often, she said. I could listen for hours if you'd let me. I, yes, I know you could. I mean, that's not what I meant, but... He replaced the bench and got back to his feet. I think the kettle's boiling. I'll go make some tea. Pray I don't make a blunder of that as well. She took a seat on the couch. You're always so hard on yourself. You only seem confident when you're on your own. Restless, she stood from the couch and followed him, leaning against the wall as he grabbed the kettle. Why are you so nervous around others? He offered no reply, lifting the kettle from the stove. Even as he did so, some hot water slopped out the spout and darkened his pants. He groaned, replaced the kettle, and pulled out a tea towel to mop up the mess. I'm falling apart at the seams. His shoulders slumped as he hung the tea towel back on its rack. I devastate all that I touch. There's no hope for me. She made her way across the kitchen and placed a hand on his arm. You are no less a man for being sensitive towards others. If anything, it makes you all the more courageous. Courageous? He looked down at the compassionate hand on his arm. Frustrated, he pushed it away. A rat has more courage. That's not true, she said. Why do you always beat yourself down like this? You're being unfair. He turned from her gaze. Could you hate me? What? Could you ever hate me, Safira? She shook her head, distressed. What are you talking about? I am dishonest, he said, still unable to face her. All the things I haven't told you. Everything I've never said. At last, his eyes met hers. I wish I had the courage to tell you. Timothy, you're scaring me. She took his hands in hers. You can tell me anything. You know that. He offered a weak smile. Yes, I know. Turning away, he refocused his attention on the kettle. You are a wonder that way. She watched in silence as he filled the teapot, hoping he would offer something more. But Timothy remained silent, retreating to the kitchen table as he poured himself a cup of tea. The moment had passed. With a heavy sigh, Safira grabbed a mug as well and sat down across from him. I wish you would tell me what's bothering you, she said. It's nothing, he said, filling her mug. That outburst was not nothing. She pushed her tea aside. Can't I know what it is? He lifted the mug to his lips, only to set it down on the table once again. I shouldn't bother you with it. No, Timothy, I insist. 
She didn't try hiding her concern. Let me know what's going on. This time he said nothing, his eyes fixed on the steaming mug before him. It was strange to see him hesitate. In the past, if something was wrong, he would have been glad to have her listen. It was only when he spoke again that she understood. It's about the break-in, he said quietly. Oh, her eyes fell to the floor. I'm sorry, he said. I shouldn't have brought it up. Maybe it's better if we... No, she said quickly. Keep going. Don't hold back for my sake. Resolute, she sat to attention. What were you going to say? He drummed his fingers on the table. Well, it was just something about that magician. The magician? This time she couldn't disguise her agitation. I thought you said the Arbiters had locked him away. Yes, yes, he said, waving his hand impatiently. Don't worry about that, it's just... Finally, he caught her gaze. He was looking for something, Safira, a stone of some sort. She reached for her mug, hoping to steady her trembling hands. He seemed to think you had it, he continued. That's why he broke in. He reached across the table and laid a hand on her arm. If you do have something like that, I need you to tell me. It might be dangerous to keep around. She patted his hand with a nervous smile rising from the table. He was obviously mistaken, she said. I don't know anything about a stone. Turning in his chair, Timothy watched as she opened the fridge, her reddening cheeks hidden behind the door. Are you sure? he said. He, I mean, the Arbiters, they told me that he was convinced. Of your having it, that is. Strange, she said, her voice drifting past the open refrigerator. I don't know where anyone would get an idea like that. She shuffled the food around the shelves, pretending to be occupied. It was more than just an idea. He broke into another man's apartment. He must have known something for certain, else he wouldn't have gone to such measures. Feeling her heart beating through her chest, Safira took a deep breath. She was a terrible liar. I can't imagine what would make a man go crazy like that. Realizing she had been hiding behind the fridge door for too long, she grabbed the milk and hoped her cheeks had lost some of their color. Honestly, I don't know anything of this crystal you're talking about. Crystal? She froze. He had only ever mentioned a stone. The silence dragged on. She was still holding the milk, still hidden behind the fridge door, but she couldn't move. And he didn't answer. She had to do something, say something, but she couldn't manage words. Hands shaking, she closed the fridge. And then he grabbed her arm. I know you have it. She cried out and dropped the milk, wringing her arm free. Her hand went to where he had grabbed her. Her wide eyes went to his. And his face went white. Goodness, Safira, I... She flinched as he stepped forward. Oh, Safira... He approached her before she could turn away, taking her in his arms. I'm sorry I raised my voice. I'm just... afraid. He stroked her hair, heartbroken. I'm so afraid. I want to keep you safe. I don't need you to keep me safe. She pushed him away, tears streaming down her cheeks. I know it's dangerous to have something like this. I'm used to it. I can deal with it. I've always dealt with it because... She covered her face, trying to stifle the sobs. He stepped forward, taking her hand in his. I know. She stared at him, terrified. How? It doesn't matter. He placed a hand on her shoulder and forced a smile. 
What matters is that it's my secret too, as well as the stone. If you let me, I can help you keep it safe. She shook her head, eyes shut tight. It's in a safe place, out of reach. You don't have to worry. But I do. This time he took both her shoulders. I want to share the burden of this secret. She moaned, slipping out from under his grasp. No, this was never supposed to happen. You were never supposed to find out. Hurrying away to the living room, she retreated to the couch, and with her back to him, she started to sob. A moment of hesitation, and he followed, taking a seat next to her. He watched her shoulders heave with each heavy breath. It was my secret. No one else was supposed to know, no one else but me. She shook her head dismally and looked to the ceiling. I wasn't even supposed to know. None of this should have happened. But now Annie knows and Kit knows and now you know too. Still unable to face him, she dropped her gaze. I knew you would worry. I knew you would want to help. But Timothy... At last, she turned to him, her eyes red from crying. This is my burden. Let me shoulder it alone. There was a terrible emptiness to her words. I've done it for so long, on my own. He stared at her a long while. He was sad, maybe even regretful, but there was a trace of a smile playing across his lips. Slowly, he reached towards her, brushing back a strand of hair from her cheek. Now, more than ever, you remind me of her. Could you ever be selfish if only for my sake? He inched closer, slipping an arm around her waist. Both so beautiful. You're so beautiful, Safira. They were very close now. Timothy pulled her closer. His gaze fell to her lips. Safira herself had already closed her eyes. The fear, the grief, it was all gone. She felt nothing aside from his breath on her skin as he leaned in. And in a moment, it was over. He pulled away, watching as she put a hand to her cheek, right where he had kissed her. They stayed staring at each other for another long moment before he rose from his seat and headed back to the kitchen. He sighed, staring at the mess in front of the fridge. I suppose I had better step out and get some more milk. Safira stayed where she was, watching as he stopped at the door and grabbed his coat. She waited for him to say something. She needed him to. But as he pulled on his hat and looked back to the couch, he only smiled. It wasn't enough, but it was all he left her with. Quickly and quietly, he slipped through the door. It was only after he was out of sight that he allowed his smile to fade. He turned up his coat collar and pulled his cap over his eyes, lumbering down the stairs as he made his way out of the tea shop. Safe from Safira's gaze, he set off down the street, keeping to himself amongst the crowd as he turned matters over in his mind. Hey, hi, I'm your narrator, Miranda Eastwood, also the author of The Truth About Goblins. If you liked this chapter, remember to add, follow, or subscribe to this channel so you can hear the next one. And if you didn't like this chapter, <laughs> oh well, I can't really do anything about that. In any case, I just thought I'd let you know about my Patreon. You can check it out if you'd like to throw some support my way. It would mean a lot to me. Not to mention there's loads of extra exclusive content that I only post on Patreon. While I'm at it, I'll mention that The Truth About Goblins is now available as a complete audiobook, and you can get it wherever you get your audiobooks. Thanks for listening. Thank you.